This episode is brought to you by Athena Health. Some healthcare IT companies have just begun to move toward connected systems. Athena Health started there. See how their innovative nationwide provider network enables the insights that drive better clinical and financial outcomes. Learn more at athenahealth.com. Mike. Lauren. Mike, if you had to describe what a meme was to someone who just didn't quite get it, how would you define a meme? Um, well, it's like an idea, usually a humorous joke. It's something that gets passed around to a lot of people and becomes its own cultural touchstone. I don't know. How am I doing? Uh, I think that's pretty nebulous, but we're bringing someone on the show who I hope can clear it up for us. Good. We need an expert. Welcome to Gadget Lab. I'm Lauren Good. I'm a senior writer at Wired. And I am Michael Calori. I'm a senior editor at Wired. And this week we're joined by Emily Dreyfus. Emily is a senior editor at Harvard Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy. And she also happens to be our former Wired colleague, where she wrote about the MBOT and Alexa and cybersecurity issues and much, much more. Emily, welcome back to Gadget Lab. Yeah, I'm so happy to be here, you guys. I feel like I'm returning home for a minute. Aww. And in many ways you are because, you know, you were known for the MBOT story in which you appeared virtually in a bunch of Wired meetings, like courtesy of a robot. And so now we don't have the MBOT with us, but we have you on Zoom. Yeah, I feel like I was kind of an early adopter of the virtual workspace situation <laughs> um, when everyone was freaking out in the beginning of coronavirus. Like, how are we all going to get this done? I was thinking, man, you know, I've actually been working remotely alone in my home for going on a decade now. Wow. So Emily's been living in the metaverse much longer <laughs> than the rest of us. <laughs> I think that's like a whole other podcast episode. We'll talk about the metaverse at some point. Um, but today we are talking about memes because yes. that's the subject of a book that you and your team have been working on. So internet memes started out harmless enough, right? A few pictures of cats and maybe some grammatically incorrect text. I mean, how bad could it be? But in reality, memes have been deployed as a weapon in culture wars for more than a decade, and they're even more persuasive than most people realize. A well-placed meme on somebody's social media timeline can lead them down a rabbit hole of radicalization, misinformation, even extremism. So Emily, you've been working on this book it's called Drafted into the Meme Wars, and it's about how memes have fueled whole ideological factions and shaped our politics in the real world. But first, take us through the history of memes. And let's go back to that question I asked Mike at the beginning of the show. What is a meme exactly? And when did they really become a thing? Mm, okay, really good question. Uh, so, you know, I am writing this book, I should say, with my team at Harvard, uh, which is led by a sociologist named Joan Donovan. Um, she's a sociologist of techno culture and movements and how they are fomented online and the interaction between those movements and the Internet. And so she is really like a foremost and inspiring expert on how media online gets used to bring people together. Uh, and then the other person we're writing the book with is our senior researcher, a man named Brian Friedberg. And he's an ethnographer who he, he calls himself a digital ethnographer and anthropologist, which means he basically lives inside the communities of the internet that use this media to become movements. Um, and so the process of writing this book for me has been learning about memes <laughs> a lot because as an internet reporter, I have to say that I ignored memes for far too long because they seemed trivial and they seemed like jokes and they seemed like something I could not pay attention to because they didn't, they didn't carry real world import. Mm -hmm. um, and the process of writing this book has taught me how wrong that was. So what's a meme and where does it come from? It's an old idea. Uh, it was coined by the philosopher Richard Dawkins. And in his book, The Selfish Gene, I believe it's called, um, he came up with this idea for a meme, which is very similar to what Mike just said. Um, a meme is an idea, an idea that like a gene in our DNA and in our body can travel through generations, morph, change, but stay with us. So he defined a meme uh, as any kind of idea that can take hold in a culture and then continue to be passed on through generations and times and contexts. 
uh, it, it didn't become an idea that was referred specifically to internet artifacts the way that we think of it now until the late 90s. Um, in fact, the guy Mike Godwin, who is best known for coining Godwin's Law, which is this law that any discourse on the internet will inevitably uh, become a discussion of Nazis. <laughs> Um, but he also is the person who first began applying the word meme to internet ideas, sticky internet ideas. Um, so that's how we commonly understand them now. What makes a meme a meme is actually, you know, a little hard to define. A lot of people think a meme has to be visual. Like it has to be an image with text on top. That's actually a specific kind of meme called a macro meme. But memes can also be slogans or hashtags or things called snow clones, which is like that saying where you kind of can insert any word into a format of a phrase and say something different. So like the Uber of television is a meme. Hmm. That's a snow clone meme. But what makes them memes is, is rather that they, they have, a, have to have a couple of characteristics, right? So they have to be memorable. We call that, you know, stickiness. They have to stick in your mind. They have to be kind of weird, in some way, so that they are memorable. So think of Stop the Steal is one of the most important memes of our time. And it's very strangely ungrammatical. And that ungrammatical nature of it makes it weird and makes it memorable. Mm -hmm. um, and then if a phrase or a piece of media or a saying or an idea can be distilled down into either an image or a soundbite, and then within that distillation of words you can convey a whole huge idea as well as conveying an in-group and an out-group. There are people who get the meme and there are people who don't. There are people for whom it's funny and people for whom it's, you know, either total gibberish or a target. Um, that's a central feature of a meme. And then another thing that will make it a meme is its ability to be remixed and used in different contexts by different people so that it can travel through the internet, become different things, um, and yet always maintain its central core of an idea. So that the thing you were just talking about, about the the, the otherness, right? Like the meme has to be weird and, and it has to be something that is not going to immediately make sense to people the first time they see it. We've all encountered that. We're like, we're browsing Twitter or around Facebook and we see a meme and we're like, okay, everybody's reacting to this and it's obviously funny, but I don't get the joke. And yep. like, how do you, how do you get the meaning? Like, what's the process that people have to go through in order to begin to understand what they're talking about when they see the meme? Okay, this is such a great question. And this process is what makes memes dangerous in terms of them becoming entrances to a rabbit hole that can turn you into an extremist without you realizing it. Oh, um, no. <laughs> and I know that that sounds so like hyperbolic, but the truth is um, that's absolutely true. Now, now let's take a meme coined or maybe perhaps popularized by Alex Jones, the phrase false flag. Now, false flag is a meme. It is not immediately apparent what it means. If you don't know the context of those words don't mean on their face what the phrase false flag actually means, okay? If you encounter that and people are interacting with it and they're saying like, this was a false flag event and you've never heard that phrase, you don't know what they're talking about, there's this curiosity gap, there's this desire to know, to figure out what, what the hell you're missing. And some people will just move past it because it's alienating. If you see a community of people discussing something that they clearly all understand and you don't understand, there's a couple different ways you can respond. One is to just move on. And the other one is to be like, I really want to figure it out. And to figure it out, you Google it or you go back in the thread on the forum you're on and read what was the thing they're talking about at the very top. Or you go on YouTube and you watch a video about a person explaining it. And all of that process of trying to figure out what on earth false flag is, in order to do that research yourself, to do your own research on the internet, you are now opening yourself up to falling into so many traps that are laid for you. So specifically the false flag one, if you're just trying to define it, 
you would find, you know, truther videos saying that the Sandy Hook massacre didn't happen. You would find so many stories alleging that all of these events in world history were part of a grand conspiracy. And you may be someone who is like, wow, this is crazy. Um, I would really prefer to look up the dictionary definition of this phrase. Ha ha ha. Or I'm, I would really like to find a wired explainer on why false flag is a meme. Maybe you'll do that. But the way the internet is uh, formatted, the, the whole system of the algorithm of search results of everything means that that might not be what you find first. You might have to search pages and pages and pages of stuff to figure out what false flag means, to figure out what the meme means. And in that time, you definitely have now been exposed to things that could be ideas that could be harmful to you. Mm. So based on an earlier conversation we had, this book is really going to cover memes spanning as far back as, you know, the 90s up to, you know, Occupy Wall Street as a movement that really wielded the power of memes up to more recent events. Um, I think of things like Gamergate or even Pizzagate. What would you say was the meme or one of the memes in our recent history that signaled some kind of turning point that you and your fellow researchers have identified as the moment of, oh, right, some people actually take these seriously and they could have real life consequences? Well, so the truth is that this, this research has taught me that we have to go way far back to identify the first memes that were powerful like this way before the internet. You know, concepts like the New World Order, that's a meme. Concepts like blood libel and anti-Semitic tropes in the Middle Ages that were used against Jews, like these are memes that, that traveled through culture. But to talk about our more recent history and internet memes and the way in which these memes have been accelerated by new technology to take culture wars online and make them go much, much faster and lead to events like January 6th. Uh, I think one of the first memes that for me resonates is um, in Occupy Wall Street. I remember when this happened, I was in San Francisco, not working for Wired, but I worked for CNET at the time. Occupy Wall Street was happening. It was 2011. And these students at UC Davis were protesting the conditions on their campus. And you guys may remember that a, a breaking news story happened because a police officer who had been empowered by the University of Davis to break up this protest very casually pepper sprayed these students in their face. Do you remember that? Yeah. He had like okay. a like a canister with a tube coming out of it and just like walked up and just sort of shot this jet stream. Exactly. And it was just so casual. And like his body language was very chill. The kids were screaming. People were yelling. There was a crowd around. Everyone was holding their phones. You know, this was only three or four years into everyone having an iPhone. Um, but everyone was streaming this, taking photos of it, taking video. And uh, one photo that was captured that day then went pretty much instantly viral. It was it, this was like the peak of Facebook becoming the thing that everyone looked at. Um, Twitter was just like showing its utility. You couldn't live stream on Twitter yet, but you could share photos. So this photo of this cop doing this to these students went viral. And then it was taken and put into Photoshop and people cut him out. And then they put him into historical famous paintings or like historical photos and the comment, it, it was a comment on like the ridiculousness of his action, of how he, like the casualness with which he wielded his, um, like his state given power was so clearly wrong. And, and in, so in some ways it became a really galvanizing moment for police brutality. And whether you were someone who was following Occupy Wall Street, whether you were an Occupy Wall Streeter yourself, or like totally against Occupy Wall Street, this made sense to you. It was powerful and it went everywhere. Uh, and then and then what was so interesting going back and looking at it was that then the meme got news coverage in a way that now sounds normal to us. You know, memes often get news coverage, but this was one of the early examples of an internet meme getting coverage and that coverage in some ways eclipsing the coverage of the event. I went back and listened to some radio reporting about the incident at UC Davis. And it was two days later and the reporters were actually just going over the funniest memes that had resulted from the incident. Oh, and no. they were just giggling so much. 
which also shows how memes can be completely decontextualized from the mm-hmm. original thing that inspired them. And the the first instances of the pepper spraying cop meme, as it came to be known, were political statements about the like casualness of police brutality. But the further from the event it got and the more it got, you know, photoshopped into like the painting of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, the less it signified the thing that it had originally signified. Mm-hmm. And, and so it could become something that was just funny. And, and in some ways, to me, it was a wake up moment listening back to that recording and realizing, wow, like as journalists, we really should have been reporting on the violence that had inspired this meme and not the fact that the meme itself was a funny use of Photoshop. Right. And that's an example of where the distillation um, of the media itself actually becomes somewhat harmful. Um, All right. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk more about how online memes can have real life consequences. In a year that transformed the way we work, learn, live and travel, perhaps no other industry saw the need to improve their virtual systems more than healthcare. Wired Brand Lab recently sat down with Brett Connor, the chief customer officer at Athena Health, to discuss how digital technologies are being adopted for a more seamless care experience. We've made incredible advances when it comes to virtual care, but we're still in the very early days. There are still a lot of interactions that happen in healthcare that are not connected. You know, one of the things that Athena Health is trying to do is make sure that we connect those data points over those different modalities of care across that continuum of care and bring it together through interoperability, through data standards, so that a primary care provider has all the information they need to make the right decisions. To learn more about how Athena Health is innovating around virtual care, watch the full episode at wired.com backslash video. So we've talked about how memes develop and proliferate on the internet, but let's get into where they go from there and how they spill over into the real world. Emily, in the first half of the show, you briefly mentioned the Capitol insurrection on January 6th. How did memes lead us there? So many different memes played a role in bringing different people to the Capitol that day. Um, And it's, you know, it's hard to pinpoint any single one that was responsible for bringing, let's say, baby boomers who believed that the second civil war was coming or, you know, QAnon adherents who were mesmerized by the where we go one, we go all meme that then convinced them to show up that day or the save the children meme, which was a hashtag that they co-opted from an actual movement and turned into a conspiracy theory. You know, there's so many memes uh, that led people to develop the worldviews that brought them to the Capitol that day. But I think that the most important one to talk about is Stop the Steal. And it's a good example because Stop the Steal was a meme whose origin we know exactly. You know, some of them we don't. Sometimes it takes a long time to figure it out because they're born in a place like 4chan, um, for instance. So like the Boogaloo meme is one that like you can trace all the way back to gun boards on 4chan, but you have to go, you ha- have to do digging to figure that out. Stop the steal. You don't really have to dig at all. It was a phrase coined and created by Roger Stone, you know, powerful behind the scenes henchman, Roger Stone. Uh, he created it in 2016 when he assumed like all of the media that Donald Trump was not going to win the election or was not, to be clear, he thought Donald Trump was not going to win the nomination for the Republican candidacy for president in 2016. And so he created the, the phrase, stop the steal and registered a website with that name because he was planning already then to claim that if Trump had not gotten the nomination. It was because the nomination was stolen from him by the Republican establishment and the political establishment and the quote unquote swamp, which is also a meme, and the deep state, which is also a meme. Um, However, he didn't need to deploy that meme at that time because Trump did get the nomination and then he did win. And so Stop the Steal, uh, the website and the idea just like sat around waiting to be deployed by an operative, and he first deployed it in 2018 in the midterm elections uh, when, like, I, I think that the Republicans didn't get as many seats as they wanted or whatever, and he was like, oh, now is when Stop the Steal can come in. They stole those from us. 
I'm sorry. I'm so sorry for that uh, impersonation of Rajasthan. No, no, no. That was gold. (laughs) Um, Stop the Steal is an interesting one because it is literally a top-down meme. It was created by, you know, a person in power. He had a clear agenda for what to do with it. And it followed some very smart uh, rubrics for being memorable. As I said, it's slightly ungrammatical. It's a three-word phrase, which the best viral slogans are. Black Lives Matter, Stop the Steal, Critical Race Theory. He savvily created a, a slogan that was evocative of some kind of wrongdoing, but not specific enough that it could be easily disproven. And also vague enough and wide enough that it could be applied in different contexts. Mm -hmm. So the stop the steal meme uh, that led to the Capitol insurrection, you know, it was it was deployed by people at the top. But then it resonated with a wide audience of people who adopted it from users on Twitter, from MAGA supporters. I mean, MAGA is another meme um, to people who were looking to professionalize and make money off of a movement that could be built around a meme. So all of these people then created companies and traveling tours to do rallies around Stop the Steal. And and all of that infrastructure and work and pre-planning was, you know, hidden by the virality of the phrase. Mm -hmm. And the virality of the phrase was a rabbit hole into an entire universe of election fraud allegations, all of which didn't need to be true, only some of them. And even if none of them were true, the penumbra of authority provided by like stop the steal lawsuits and officials in the government using the phrase stop the steal, including the president of the United States, gave enough sincerity to the idea that this meme conveyed that it was it was impossible to ignore for people who wanted to believe that it was true. So earlier in the show, you know, when Mike gave his description of a meme, I said, ah, sounds kind of nebulous. But actually, what you're saying is it's that uh, sort of um, opacity that can exist around some of these phrases. And the fact that they do catch on, but can be used or misused in different ways is part of what makes it a meme. Totally. If it was too specific, it couldn't be a meme. It, it wouldn't be able to be remixed. It wouldn't be able to be uh, reapplied. And there are some memes that are pretty specific and therefore then they're like a niche meme, you know, like the memes that only resonate in the handyman Facebook group because they're all about, you know, fixing sinks or whatever. Like there's very, there's like journalist memes, you know, they're not, they don't mm-hmm. have a wide adoption outside of their in-group um, because they're too specific. But a, st- a, a meme that is nebulous enough and that people can project their own ideas onto, and that can be taken out of a context and put into a different context, is very, very powerful. So if you're a Facebook or a Twitter or a Reddit, and you encounter something that has this like nebulous, obtuse meaning, but also opens up uh, a door to this world of you know bad information, and you're tasked with eradicating misinformation off your platform, what do you do? Like, what does Twitter do with something like Stop the Steal before it becomes obvious what it is? Well, they had enough warning that they should have banned it immediately. You know, they can stay see. They see these things going viral. They see who's spreading them, especially with something like Stop the Steal. Stop the Steal was being deployed as a hashtag on social media by known and prolific and very influential disinformers. And, you know, that's a clue Mm. to the platform to have been taking it seriously in the first place. Um, You know, before... The insurrection, Twitter and Facebook had been very, very resistant to taking any kind of mitigating action against a sitting president because he was, after all, the president of the United States and they were a private company and they felt that if he wanted to use their platform to reach his audience, it wasn't really the the place of a private company to be silencing the president of the United States. They changed their mind after they saw what happened with Stop the Steal. And they kicked Trump off Twitter. They kicked him off Facebook. And the the impact was immediate. 
I mean, the impact on the news and information ecosystem online was incredibly immediate, which goes to show that that kind of deplatforming is very important and it is within their right and their power to do it. Um, But to your broader question, you know, not every meme is like stop the steal. Not every meme is, is so obviously a problem. And I would say what they most need to do is understand that this is what memes can do. There's some naivete. And I, and I admit, as I said earlier in the show, I mean, I had some of that naivete. Like as a senior editor at Wired, I have to admit, I was always like, why would we write an entire article about this meme that only these nuts over here care about? Or like, why is it worth our time to write a a news article about a funny meme. Like it's, I know that it's enjoyable, but, it, but it's not news. Like I really have to admit, I didn't totally get it. <laughs> so you're saying that you would not have assigned the Bernie Sanders mittens story. I would have. No, no, no. So here's the thing. <laughs> Maybe I would have, I, I, I absolutely would have, but I think I also would have, would have, and I haven't read your Bernie Sanders memes. Uh, oh no, I, I think Angela Watercutter wrote it for us, but I mean, everybody wrote the Bernie Sanders mittens story, right? I think that's like the, one of the memes that people on both sides of the political aisle could kind of rally behind this idea of like a grumpa being transported straight from Vermont into the inauguration. <laughs> totally. And, like, and, you know. and I don't think that those articles were harmful. Um, I also think that like they can be moments to explain, like that's a good meme to use as a, um, as a way into explaining the power of memes because it went everywhere. It was like viral in every political context. It was viral in every state. And so if you want to talk about, hey, what is the risk of exposure to bad ideas through memes? Or what is the power of memes to bring people into a group together where they then create their own like internal lingo and have their own badges and signifiers of what they believe in. That was like a great example of how to explain that to people. But what can Facebook and Twitter do? First of all, you know, admit that this is a function of memes and that memes can only have this power when they are diffused to the widest possible audience. And the widest possible audience for these memes is on their platforms. Um, And so, you know, they just, what I really want from them is to just not say they're just memes because that's not true. Mm -hmm. They are much, much more than that. So while we're waiting for technology platforms to catch up to spotting harmful memes, is the idea that we as consumers need to get better about spotting them ourselves? Well, I, I, I mean, I think media literacy and meme literacy is important and, and vital, but honestly, it's such a cop-out for these companies and for policymakers and even for journalists to put the onus of this kind of responsible consuming of information on, the, on individual people, because these are systems that are so intricate and so vast and journalists right now us all of us in this room are being tasked with being the unpaid moderators of these platforms you know i mean i'm sure that all that both of you have had the experience that i've had even when i was at wired of like finding something that was going viral calling facebook to ask them about it and then being like oh my god thank you for pointing this out we're going to take it down <laughs> And, and and this happens all the time, you yeah. know. There's read any reporting about fake Antifa Facebook groups that were organizing violence against people in the Pacific Northwest or any of these things. And in the articles about them, you'll see the statement, you know, after being asked for a comment about these, the platforms took the pages down. Um, and, and what that shows is that, like, yeah. Some people are watching. It's they're journalists, they're researchers, they're they are independent researchers on Twitter who are able to notice this and that is proof that the platforms could be noticing it themselves. And this is why I also say, you know, oftentimes a meme can be an entrance to a rabbit hole and on its face it doesn't seem harmful. And you can see if you look in it, like, let's talk about the politically incorrect board on 4chan because it's a like classic place for people to go and um, kind of workshop these ideas. You can go on those boards and you'll see people workshopping. What is the version of this meme that we should drop on Facebook so that it won't get mitigated and so that boomers will see it and it'll lead them to this other thing? Like they're having this conversation outright Mm -hmm. and and Facebook should know that and should have people watching those forums. 
Because then they have no excuse when they say, well, the one that was on Facebook was just this harmless one that didn't show anything. And then if, if I am able to email them and say, I literally just found the entire thread where these people workshopped putting one on your platform that looked like it wasn't a big deal when really it was, if I could find it, then, then they can find it. All right. So what I'm hearing from you is that too much of the onus is put on news consumers to spot all of these various memes that are flying at us and that the platforms need to do a better job of moderating content. I think we've heard that one before. (laughs) All right. That was great, Emily. Thank you. Let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to ask you for your recommendation. Has this ever happened to you? You need to see a doctor. You search and find one that looks good. You wait on hold to book an appointment. You rearrange your schedule, and when you finally go in, you find out this doctor doesn't even take your insurance. Well, there's a solution. Just download the free ZocDoc app, the easiest way to find a great doctor and instantly book an appointment. With ZocDoc, you can search for local doctors who take your insurance, read verified patient reviews, and book an appointment in person or video chat. Never wait on hold with a receptionist again. Whether you need a primary care physician, dentist, dermatologist, psychiatrist, eye doctor, or any other specialist, ZocDoc has you covered. Go to ZocDoc.com wired and download the ZocDoc app to sign up for free. Every month, millions of people use ZocDoc. ZocDoc makes healthcare easy. Now is the time to prioritize your health. Go to ZocDoc.com wired and download the ZocDoc app to sign up for free and book a top-rated doctor. Many are available as soon as today. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash wired. Emily, what is your recommendation? Okay, I, I decided on two random recommendations. One is that I urge you to look up what happens to an artichoke if you let it become a flower. Nice. Okay. And if... Should we look it up or should we just let that happen? Both. If you have access to an (laughs) artichoke plant, definitely don't pick that artichoke. Just let it become a flower and it's going to blow your mind. (laughs) Okay. Did this happen to you recently? Yes. Well, I I bought a flower in in a farmer's market and was like, what is this absurd thing that I've never seen in my life and that looks like an alien and I don't understand what it is? And they were like, this is an artichoke. And it shocked me. Wow. Okay. Did it start like, you know, snapping its jaws and saying, feed me, Audrey? <laughs> it looks like it does go through a period where it then smells very bad, but it looks like a sea anemone. It's crazy. So what's the other one? You said you had two. Yeah. Okay. The other one is um, a book I'm looking at that is by an author named Colin Woodard, and it's called American Nations. And if you're someone who's interested in like cultural differences and regional differences in the U S and how like areas get their personality. It's such a cool book. Very cool. I'm so curious. Unpack that for us a little bit more. Okay. So it's about uh, the way in which like different regions in the U S were actually uh, populated and peopled by different cultures. So like, pilgrims moved to the Northeast and Danish people and people from um, the Netherlands moved to New York City. And there's how you can get, he traces the history of the different peoples who came to all of the different regions of the US and the way they got there and where their origins were into how those places then got their personalities. Mm. And it explains, it really just resonates so well. It explains so much why like Louisiana has a lot more in common with French Canada than other parts of the South right next to it, or why the um, Western coast of the U S has a lot more in common with the Northeast and coast of the U S than it does with like the mountain West. Um, So it breaks these regions in the U S down and then goes through their entire history of the kind of characteristics and struggles of their people. And you know, I think that there are some people who have said that it's a it's a simplistic explanation of some of these stereotypes of people, but it's a very good jumping off point to understand how like hundreds of years and thousands of years of history can come and create different cultures within a single nation. American nations. All right. Those are great recommendations. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, like now uh, I know why uh, crab cakes and lobster rolls are so popular in San Francisco. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, what's your recommendation? 
So uh, this one's a little bit on topic because I'm going to send you to Reddit, uh, the birthplace and uh, proving ground of many memes out there in the world. Uh, so there's this fun little Easter egg inside Reddit, and it's called R Random. And so if you go to you know Reddit.com/r/random, it redirects you automatically to a random subreddit. So it's not actually a subreddit, it's a redirection engine. So you go from uh, our random to anywhere on Reddit and it really just shows all kinds of stuff. So Lauren just typed it in and she landed on the AirPods Pro subreddit. I just <laughs> I just clicked on it because I have it set as a as a bookmark in my browser and I landed on the R Poland Reddit subreddit. <laughs> so um, this is what I would recommend that you do. I recommend that you make it a bookmark on your browser bar because when you're just like bored and you need five minutes of distraction and you just want something to look at that's not the infinite scroll of doom known as social media you can just go to our random and it will drop you into a section of reddit that maybe hasn't seen any action in six months maybe has like millions of subscribers and it's really interesting maybe is a, a section of culture that you've never experienced before and never would have experienced like uh blade and soul which looks like a game lauren what is that yeah i just i just answered it again it's a korean fantasy martial arts massively multiplayer online role-playing game um otherwise known as an mmorpg developed <laughs> by nc soft's team bloodlust and if i sound like i know what i'm talking about it's because i just read that out loud you read that on the description the See, so there you go so you know something that you never knew about that you now found because of this randomness machine so that's that's my recommendation check it out make a bookmark for our random that's pretty good. Thanks. I love that. It reminds me of the Wikipedia option to like go to any random Wikipedia page. Absolutely. So Lauren, your turn. You're the host. What's your recommendation? I admit when I came up with this recommendation and I jotted it down in our weekly podcast script, Mike, I wondered if I was perhaps stealing it from you because I recommend White Lotus on HBO Max. Yes. Yeah, Mike and I are both fans of the show. Emily, have you had the chance to check this one out yet? No, I saw people talking about it on Twitter and was like, okay, good. Apparently there's a new show I can watch, but I know nothing about it. Yeah, when you take some time off after uh, you're all done with this, the book project, you should definitely check out this show. As I say often, if anyone needs an HBO login, let me know. I give it out freely. I think that's why HBO didn't send me the press kit this year that they normally send people because I saw people tweeting about that and I was like, where's my kit? Um, but anyway, um, yeah, it's a it's a fantastic show about a, a group of extremely privileged people who descend upon a Hawaiian luxury resort. These people don't all know each other necessarily, but they, they traveled on the same boat together and then they are at the same resort together. So they keep sort of running into each other at the pool and on the beach and whatnot. And um, they're interacting with the staff at the resort who... Um, um, are more diverse and presumably, you know, don't have their incomes are not as high as the people who are who are vacationing at the resort. And, um, you know, it's 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 satire. It's a really dark kind of I think the New Yorker called it a tragic comedy. And I think that's a good way to look at it. A, a really dark look at the interactions between these groups of people. Um, and it's it's just quite good at the time of this taping i've watched three episodes and i think by the time the, this podcast comes out there'll be another episode um check it out white lotus hbo max mike uh, do you have anything to add to that it's a mike white show so if you're familiar with mike white he did enlightened on hbo he also wrote uh school of rock and nacho libre and he was a writer on freaks and geeks uh this is uh, a, another hit in his long output of hits i would say less like school of rock and more like freaks and geeks for rich grown-ups yes absolutely Oh, wow. That sounds amazing. I, when you were describing it at first, I was hoping it was going to be like a Jordan Peele style thing and it would like evolve into a massive revenge violence of where all of these rich, privileged people get their comeuppance. But it doesn't sound quite like it's going to be like that. Not quite yet, but we don't know where it's going. I mean, I guess some of the press who write about this kind of thing regularly, I've seen all the screeners for it yeah. and know where it's going. But um, it's a miniseries. It's only, I think it's only six episodes. Yeah. Long. Oh, cool. so. Well, you know, speaking of press, Lauren, I did get the press kit for this. You did? Yes. It's an Aloha shirt, a box of ashes, and a bag of ketamine. Yes. That's amazing. <laughs> also, a, also a kit to, you know, how to, how to make your way through a midlife crisis. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. All right. 
All right, that's our show for this week. Thank you, Emily Dreyfus, former Wired One, for joining us on this week's Gadget Lab podcast. We look forward to um, reading your book next year when it comes out, drafted into the meme wars. We'll keep an eye out for that. And uh, we miss you. Thank you so much for having me on, you guys. I miss you. Yay. I mean, not yay that you miss us, but yay, good to see you. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And thanks to all of you for listening. As always, if you have feedback, you can find all of us on Twitter. Just check the show notes. Uh, This show is produced by the excellent Boone Ashworth. Goodbye for now. We'll be back next week. Let's talk about the most fun, stylish, charged up electric car out there. The Mini Cooper SE. It's an electric unlike any other. It looks like a Mini, drives like a Mini, Because it is a Mini. Electrified. Perfect for the city or for the burbs. Stand out from all other electrics and then speed up. It's Mini go-kart handling with an electric charge. Starting at only $29,900. Reserve yours at MiniUSA.com.